My name is Dan Hurlbert. I'm at Carleton College. I taught film and theater for about 15 years before jumping over to Carleton um, about four years ago now, um, where I work in video. I kind of manage video production for campus and then um, help faculty develop instructional videos. That's been a great move for me. I also have the privilege of taking some classes with Dr. Susan Manning, uh, who I'll let introduce herself to. Hello everyone, I'm Susan, and I'm coming to you from a Chicago suburb. So I'm very sorry that I can't be with you in person. As Dan knows, I work remote for UW Scout, and I teach instructional design and some other courses. And I also work for a technology company, also remote, doing a lot of training and client support. And video is uh, near and dear to my heart because it is one of the most effective ways I have of communicating with students and also my clients. Very cool. Um, thank you. It's good to see you. Thank you, as always. I never know if I'm actually in frame when I read it. So you, just you are. You are, right? <laughs> <laughs> My name is Julia Strand. Dan Hernandez. Marty Baylor. I'm Aaron Swoboda. Clara Hardy here. Nancy Breaker, and I'm the director here at the Arboretum. Your lesson for today is about the Keeling Curve. We're down here at the Cannon River in the Arboretum. A lot of people are dying because of indoor air pollution. Let's make a cylinder. The kind of style of book that we're going to make is called a codex binding. So why are interference and diffraction important? So I'm going to give you uh, a heads up on some of the prominent features of the brain. In the early 1960s, the folk revival was really popular. Within the year, we see these continuous oscillations of CO2. You must determine how many sailboats are on the lake and how far away they are. To perform a good close reading of a passage requires not only that we examine the passage with great care. Remember that Socrates has insisted that he has to defend himself against two sets of charges. It's possible for them to see which servers you're talking to and when, how long your messages are, how frequent your messages are, and lots of other metadata with which they can learn more about your computing habits. Pounded this clay into an egg shape. It's a big field of view and you have so many grains to look at. You can see the corpus callosum, which is the white matter at the top. And I'm going to draw what I see from the top, which is a line of peaks. For spectators, both the theatrical production and the Temple of Apollo would have been in full view. Well, you can imitate the flowing water sign. First, Alice says, let's use the SSH version 2 protocol. The width of your finger and the distance from the Earth to the Sun. That difference in land mass is what's contributing to this oscillation. We see that the light spreads out more and more. And as much rice as produced by the entire country of China all of last year. I have already solved this problem in my garage. In the first passage, Socrates presents himself as philosophizing and examining others for the sake of his own needs. These are a few examples of the power of exponential growth. Ask yourself, who's the you he's talking about? And if you have questions, post them on the forum or email me. Wrap up your chords. And be ready to go. I imagine this overview has left you with a lot more questions than you started with. That just means there's a lot more fun stuff for you. So I've had a great opportunity to work with some fun faculty, and they've, they've been uh, helpful in finding visual. So we're going to talk a lot about why the visual is so important in creating this. Um, let me go back. Let's see. All right, most of you watched this short video, um, and we're, we're going to watch it again. Some of you have given me feedback already on it, which will help guide our discussion a little bit today. Let's take a quick look. Because this is embedded in YouTube, uh, it is going to play right back in Google Slides and we don't have to jump on it. So if you're thinking how can I make a presentation, 
play seamlessly in that balance out the Vimeo, YouTube did the last year for Google Slides. Whenever I do a Vimeo video, you'll see us jump three different Hi, I'm Dan. You'll have three questions to answer after watching a short video about planning and instructional video. It'll be worth 93% of your overall grade this term. Good luck. Did you know that only 59% of YouTube viewers will watch a video for an entire minute? Video use in higher education is growing tremendously, and we hear constantly that we should use more videos, make more videos, post more videos. But I don't want to be bombarded with mindless, slow-moving, or carelessly crafted propaganda every time I flip on a screen. And your students don't either. In fact, it's proven that they'll tune you out pretty quickly. Yet there is power in a well-planned instructional video. So before you tape another lecture, know these three things. Your concise learning goal, how you'll assess the learning, and what visuals will help enhance that learning. And then before you press record, think through what will engage your audience and how you'll gauge whether or not they've learned. Yes, under here. At least 59% of you watch this whole video. Perfect. So from that video, um, and then in a Google form, you folks watched the video, many of you did. And then you went through and you answered a series of questions. So I created a, a simple video, and then where I put it, how I delivered it, and what that assessment was, the questions and quiz that I created, was something very separate from the video, but it gave us a great starting point for today. Um, some of, like you see, and I did this yesterday at about noon, if you watched it and answered the questions later, I'm sorry, I didn't do the responses one that now. But we can see little things like most of you are getting it right. There's one of you that didn't I actually think that was my boss. She didn't want everybody to get it right. She took it out. And here's another one of the questions where we can see that everybody got, got everything right. And then some of your questions are on our next slide. And if, again, if you submitted something and then it's not on here, hopefully you can come back to that today. But how to make visuals more appealing, tips on making instructional videos more engaging, how long does it take? That's hilarious. How to create effective videos, how to incentivize students to actually watch the videos. Um, and then uh, novices, and then probably a couple of you as novices in here. Um, so how to think about those videos. Oh no, that was me. There are folks out there, and Susan is a great um, great example of using it, but not overusing it. There are whole courses that we can take that suggest video. And there are folks that say video is great for everything, and everything should be videoed. Um, which you can videotape right now to laugh and applaud your hours. The video isn't always new, and, and there, are, there are times where you need the person person time, but you need something else. So I always couch saying, I'm a video guy, but I also know that you can't kind of personally as well. And there's some things that video does not do. So is the video the best answer? Definitely, maybe. Uh, best instructors still have to acknowledge passion for the subject, organized, prepared, sense of humor, that kind of thing. Um, the spectrum of instructional video, you can, one of the great things about technology, you know, I tell people we're in this future, and uh, I can do it, it's now video tape, you can jump on the phone, and be across the country in, in three hours. Uh, I was telling my son yesterday, it only took me three hours to get from Minnesota out to, uh, where are we that thing? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the day is going to get better. It's the recollection of more quicker. Um, and 100 years ago, it would have taken months for them to do it. He said, 100 years ago, I'm great, brother, because you have to come here. I'm going to take my 60 feet from here. Anyway. Long story short, in video, you, you can't sit and you can just rack stuff down. You have a brilliant idea, you sit down at your computer and you rattle something off really quick. Um, but you can also take a little bit more time. You, you can develop something that you know you want to reuse over and over, and then you can come up with something that's, that's kind of showcase material that you might want to reuse. And there are some of the videos you saw this morning that were, we spent a little bit more time on um, for that. The largest chunk of time occurs in, in pre production, all of the planning that goes into it, and then the rest of it will kind of sit through here too. Dale Andrews' cone of experience. There are different scholars that say this is, they have to abide by this, and others that say this makes no sense, or it's not true at all. But what we do know about <clears throat> student use uh, or student learning is that if they read or see or hear something, 
it's, it's rarely going to stick unless we give them something to do with it. So our goal here isn't just video. It's what are you doing with the video that will help, help engage the learning. So my planning process is, um, first thing is know the learning objective. And we have a handout, and I'll have you take a look at that too, and this will, it'll walk you through that. Um, but I, I always start with the learning objective, and because I'm a big fan of keeping the video short, it's going to be pretty concise. We're learning one thing, maybe two, uh, and we're writing that out. We also need to know how we're going to do the assessment before we start making any videos. Um, and then we'll create the script and outline, and then a big emphasis is on the visual. And how can that visual be together? Susan does something similar, but a little bit different. You're on. Okay. Um, one of the great things about having Dan there in person and having me here is you really get to see the contrast in style and my productions are done at home. So I was a novice 10, 15 years ago and developed these skills by experimenting and without very much professional assistance. Dan, on the other hand, he's the counterpoint, he's the professional. My planning often begins with a story. So I, I do have an objective. I have a main point that I want to make, and I think about what story can I tell and how can I relate that to real life so that my students will retain this idea years later. And I actually started using video when I was teaching English as a second language. And I was asked to do this at a distance, and I wanted my students to know how to use the language in everyday living. So I took them for a tour around my house, and I would use various uh, structures. For instance, I was telling Dan, my favorite video was made in my bathroom, in my bathrobe, in my kitchen, teaching people about making coffee and using adverbs of frequency. Like, I always drink coffee in the morning. I never use creamer. I usually use this mug or that mug, whatnot. Um, so my planning starts with a story and an object that relates to the purpose. And I'll tell you more about that process as we go on. Um, we won't spend a lot of time on learning goals, but uh, you know, the smart keep make sure you're specific, it's measurable, and, and those those kinds of things. Some examples of learning goals. You need to be able to identify five key points, outline, um, calculate, explain, um, and keep it in short, one little sentence that says, here's what we're going to learn. Um, so what I would like you to do now, either with whomever you're sitting by or just on your own, when you walked in, there were two handouts. One of them is called an instructional video starter document. So what I would like you to do is take just a moment to write down a learning goal. Maybe it's something specific to what you teach or where you work. But maybe it's something very basic that so I'm going to teach a student how to use a pencil. Um, did you? What do you um, The instructional video starter doc. Right at the very top of the instructional video starter doc, number one, just says learning goals. So go ahead and just write in what your proposed learning goal is. Can you have one assessment template on your uh, that's a great question. You may have more than one, and often we do that with our students. We give them some kind of a, a practice or a hands-on activity, and then at the end of the term, at the end of the unit, we give them a second kind of assessment strategy. Maybe they do a quiz or they have a final. Um, so you may write down one or two or ten, um, and we'll force you to follow through with any of them. All right, let's roll. <clears throat> Bloom Stacks Army is another helpful, helpful tool, and I work with a colleague of mine over at St. Olaf College, also in Northfield, Minnesota, in Ben Godfrey. And we developed kind of a taxonomy for instructional videos. And so we're going to take a little bit of time to go through video types and the value of certain video types um, for different kinds of instruction. Some of the things that we're going to look at, we'll talk about the complexity is easy to make and difficult to make. What's the value of it? That list on the right side of the screen goes everything from absences to I can reuse it over and over and over again. And then what um, you know, what level of understanding are, are we going to, to get to? So for example, 
Um, we have three, we're doing a talking head or lecture capture style video. Um, there are some things that these are good for, and there's some things that they're not as, as good for. And I've got three examples to show just a little bit um, of a couple of them. We'll start. <coughs> There we go. Susan, we're going to watch you stand in the garage. Okay. Jason, none of us have any extra time these days. If you're going to start generating something, you probably want that process to be effective and efficient. And that doesn't matter whether you're 8 years old or 80 years old. When it comes to instructional design, the process of alignment is one way that we ensure that success for the learner. I don't need a car metaphor when I'm talking about alignment. Think about driving your car and what it's like if the wheels are out of alignment. It might shimmy and shake, it might pull to the side, you can lose control with the front of the Same is true with construction. Good. So, an example, and I, I'm always so impressed that she just stands there and rattles it off. I, I edit all the time, so I can make a thousand mistakes. She doesn't make any mistakes, she just stands there and delivers the whole thing. Just a, a bit of style, <laughs> stylistic difference. Um, another one. Wait, 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 Dan, there's a question. Oh, Sorry, Su Susan, were you using a teleprompter? No, I was not. Wow, <laughs> that's just all, that's just, you have, yes, whole, you have the talking points in your head and you go. Yes, there's a lot of planning. Did you make that goes on up here? Yes. yes. But I, and I will comment on that one. Uh, I was asked to do a video on the concept of alignment as part of UW Scouts faculty development program, a larger initiative. And I assumed that all the other faculty had been going into a studio and doing it with the perfect backdrop and the lighting. And so I volunteered to drive to Menominee, which is five hours from where I live. Mm -hmm. And the person in charge of the project said, no, 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 no. I want you to do it like you do your course videos at home or wherever you're going to go. So given that I was talking about this car metaphor, I went to my mechanic's house and I said, Howie, can I stand in your garage and shoot this video? And that's why you see my friend's car in the background, because I think it gives so much more of a context. It's memorable. Yeah, question. Did you at least write a script before you? No. What? Yeah. <laughs> you don't need a script yet? No. I'm impressed. Uh, I, I, you know, I just rehearse it in my head until I get it to about where I want it, and then I'll tell you, I'll reinforce this later. I usually shoot the same thing at three, at least three times. So I'll run through it, pause, run through it again, pause, and one of those three is usually perfect. Very cool. Let's look at another one uh, that does use a teleprompter. Al Montero is an economics professor at, at Carleton. Um, he's a wizard. He uh, but actually, what I've found from everybody that is a wizard is that they're amazed by the teleprompter. Al could stand there and give me a brilliant lecture with mohawks and us in it at all. And he came in with this thing all organized, and I said, just email that to me. He threw it on the teleprompter, and he said, holy smokes, I don't even have to think. Because then you can start thinking about your inflection, and you don't have to think about eye contact. So there is some value to a teleprompter, but you absolutely don't need it, particularly if we're trying to keep these videos short. Um, so Al's, he likes, he teaches economics, he likes AVC and then so it's great to come here. So, Paris are the taxes on trade, imports and also exports. And here we're primarily going to talk about imports. Paris are all about access to foreign markets. As you know, so, of Paris, the general agreement... So he's got slides, slides are changing behind him with three different camera angles set up in there. We don't need that. That countries, that. countries Impose on their the trade market or in the background. As you see here in this slide, these are the different types of tariffs that are possible. Uh, so it, it's the same, it's a talking head. It's somebody there delivering some content. What Al did was reinforce things with some slides and some bullet points. Uh, and you, you, even don't, you don't even need to do something as, uh, as complicated.
complicated as that. Ashley over at St. Olaf just stands in front of a wall and writes down a piece of paper. Um, and you can do that with a whiteboard. You can do that with a chalkboard. You can do all kinds of just stand here. Here's my concept. But all of them found a different way to include visuals. And, and you've got to keep coming back to visual, whether it's the environment like Susan does, um, or it's the slides, or it's the chalkboard. The visual is really important to reinforce what you're saying for, for students. Um, so, if we were to jump back into the dinner mode, so I would say the complexity of this kind of video as well. You flip on a webcam or you just stand in front of um, a camera and you talk, it's great for students that are going to be gone. You know, and we all have the athletics are gone or somebody's sick and they say, what did we learn? I'll well, get the note from a student or this is kind of what we talked about. Lecture capture, now it's starting to cover some of that for us. Um, but when you have a new concept where there's visuals and you've got a lab in class and the student misses that lab having this document that is just really important. So it's good for content review, preview, students can go back and review it before the test or the exam or their project. Um, I say it's time or location control students can watch it at any place at any time, 3 a.m. or 3 a.m. when they're not doing the best work. And so on this uh, you can add depth to content. Methodology, philosophy, and you can advance discussion. Talk about something in class and you know, feed them something deeper to think about outside of class so that we can advance the discussion the next day. Um, you can also provide or explain assignments, and that's something that I think Susan does really well. She gives an overview of that um, of a concept with the, with the video. And then time saver, it's in the can. If, if you build it right, you don't mention dates, you don't uh, you don't say here's what the assessment will be. You can use this in the same class next term, or you could use it in a different class. I might be teaching um, an English class here, and a, and a British lit class here, and some historical Latin class, and the authors are, are the same. So you could use it in the different classes as well. Susan, did you want to add anything to, to this one? Just that if you're using it to explain an assignment, Keep that separate from explaining content because later on, if you change the assignment, then you got to reshoot the video or edit significantly. Yeah. And I would say that in terms of how are we doing on the Zoom scale here, so far we just sit there and talk to them. They've, they've done no real learning. They've given them content. They remember, they might understand it a little bit more, but they haven't applied it. So just the video. Does not get us up here at the higher level of room sex out of it. Um, Susan, we're looking at the encouraging video for course introductions. Talk right. a little bit about that. Um, sometimes my students are <coughs> a little nervous about what this course is going to entail. And so I will give them either a tour of what it looks like in our learning management system or talk a little bit about the final project. Um, especially for those global thinkers, they like to see the big picture. And I let the sequential thinkers know that they can take it one little step at a time. But um, having that overview tends to relax my students significantly. Plus, they get to see and hear me, and they know there's a real person behind things. Oh, I know the other thing I wanted to say. I've been experimenting with a, a product called Flipgrid. It's a web-based tool where students can, you can pose a question in video and they can answer you in video if they have a webcam. And I've been trying to get my adult students to introduce themselves in icebreakers using the video format. And it's been really interesting being some of the hesitation uh, to even turn on the webcam, just like I'm doing today. They would, that would mortify them. But especially in an online environment to try to build some kind of cohesiveness. Uh, there's not even getting your, your face out there, having the students connect. And you can connect with people visually as much as we do on concepts or philosophies. Um, so, but the next one we're going to look at is expert interviews. And I won't play these videos, but it gives you an idea. If I ask them, many of you bring in, guests from off campus and if you can sit them down and have them talk for five minutes on some concept, then you've got some material that you can plug into your, your class and maybe create an assessment with that. Um, that can be really valuable. Or 
you have somebody on campus that is the expert, and they can also sit down. Like Marty um, does physics, and she did a great example using our whiteboard, which really was just a pane of glass that we got some IKEA here, that's some lights, and strung them around and turn them on and um, shine the camera straight through the glass. And so it's about 150 bucks because we thought the camera was all sold around. But yeah. Does, doesn't the presenter have to write backwards? Yeah. To, no. Um, as long as there isn't something that the audience would recognize, like a word behind her, if there was a word behind it. So what we do is after she films it, we flip it. Um, if if she's writing backwards, um, there there can be there can be an issue, but we just we flip it, yeah. and then we make sure there's nothing in the background that the audience is missing. Mine's not backwards. Um, same thing. We have a, a Spanish instructor, Paul Marabo, Calvary Blanco. That, that brings in guest film directors, um, activists, and she creates these participatory video units where students are doing language plus film all the time. And she brings in these directors, and then she has us come over and sit down and do a short interview with those directors so that in subsequent classes she can show the film and then have the, the guest director um, give, them, give some background or say, Here, well, here's what the next steps might be. So these expert interviews, I think, are well, we'll see what I check out. I think they're great for methodology, philosophy, um, adding depth to content, but it also does some of these other things. Students gone on the guest directors give them a lecture. We can have that um, available to, um, and then time savers in the team. Here we're still staying kind of low. All we're doing is we're just delivering some content. Here's what somebody is going to look at. Um, the next one we're going to look at. Screencasting and there's a lot of uses for screencasting. The top one here, Sarah Mertz, um, is a psychology instructor at Carleton. I don't know if I need to show you, but I'll put her. Oh, it's private and this doesn't know what I need, so I might skip it. Um, but she just says, hey, you folks are going to have to write a research paper. Here's what it looks like. And she pulls the research paper up and says, this needs to look like this, this needs to look like this. I want to make sure you have. You cited this way, uh, and it's a great way for her not to have to stand in class and say, oh, "You missed it." Okay, here's the way you have to do it. She just points students towards the site and says, "Watch this," and then she's free to have a lot of class time for it. Susan, I'm going to click on your using games introduction. Okay. Let's talk about how you know what to do in the class. I'm first going to direct you to this page called How This Works. This is the text explanation of the class. I'll also recommend that you go to My Map. This is an interactive progress map that shows all the activities for the course. These activities in the warm-up category are not required to complete the course, but they're highly recommended because this is where you... Great. Do you want to talk briefly about the purpose of memory? Oh, well, again, I teach at a distance, and it's an efficient way of helping students know where to start, what to do, what resources to find, uh, and that is just screencast. There's nothing else to it. So if you have a program that you use and you need to have students walk through it, I have my students, I have about 30 students that work for me creating the videos, instruction videos. Um, and they run off the campus and they film things. They're also in the wizards that come into the classroom and fix things when computers aren't working. Uh, so they need to go through training when they start for us. And all of those students have the, the students that are year three and year four, they create the screencast for here's how you log in every day, here's how you do this, here's how you do that. And then what Susan's video shows, and she works for Credly and uses a badging system, and we do something similar where students get a badge once they've completed all the different assignments. And then students can move up to be a team lead or, or that kind of thing as well. But the screencasting is a great way to um, you know, show a program or show something that they, they are doing on the computer anyway. Um, let's bounce back here. Um, Susan, you want to talk just a little bit about screencast as a feedback tool? Right. So earlier, Dan talked you through that Sarah Burtz uses screencasting to explain how to do an assignment. 
when my students turn in certain assignments and the feedback can get rather complex, I screencast my talking through the review of their work. So this started when I was teaching writing and I didn't want to fix my students' errors because they weren't going to learn anything from that. But I wanted to point out where the problem was, <coughs> what the nature of the problem was, and then to have them edit on their own. So I found this was a very valuable tool for speakers of English as a second language because they could listen to me again and again and again. I used to sit down with each student and privately conference, but Three minutes later, they forgot what I said. So I started to record this, and it works marvelously whether you're seeing those students every day or if you are teaching at a distance. So it's a way of giving feedback while the student follows along. You can highlight, you can write on the document, and they can hear you. And the other thing is they hear your tone of voice. So they, over time, they become less fearful of you. They realize you're really helping them. You're not criticizing. You're just pointing out where work can be improved. So this is one of my most powerful instructional strategies, is giving feedback in that way. Great. Um, some screencast software, if you're familiar with it, um, I like ScreenFlow on a Mac. We use Camtasia, um, and some of our faculty do as well. Dan, there was a question in the back of the room. Sorry. Oh, I'm just curious about the size of files that this kind of thing can generate. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, actually, as Dan's talking about, I use Jing, which limits me to five minutes, which is ideal. If I can't get the feedback done in five minutes, both the student and I are in trouble. Um, and, and this is where, and I said right at the beginning, a lot of my video work is done up here first. So I will have reviewed that work. So that's a time and question for five minutes. What does that generate in terms of, of megabyte file size that we put it back up? Well, maybe one line seeing, and it gets... No, we're seeing it gets uploaded to a, an external server, and it creates a scrambled URL. I give the URL to the student, so they watch it web-based. So I don't have to worry about file size. It'll depend a little bit about it. Frame rate and resolution. Um, five minutes is, I might say, like 30 megabytes tops. Um, I, maybe even smaller than that, maybe even a little more. We do um, Google and on Google Campus, and so a lot of the things we can share is there, and I can, I can share the link. Or when we deliver video to faculty, we just have a, a shared media folder and by faculty members. Don't have to access their folder, so if you do have a student sort of I think the reason I ask is because our students are not very tech savvy and getting them to do Moodle properly requires a lot. And I try to avoid anything that takes them outside of our accreditation system. So if that has a file limit, I mean, the link makes sense. If I can put it in Moodle, yeah. Absolutely, or it can be it can be emailed through. And I might separate Moodle from tech. Um, not really. Moodle's cumbersome, and it's, it's, a, it's a little bit, it's good. So everybody I think struggles just a little with it. Um, but to be able to just send them a link um, is a great, great I think that's the way we got it from Moodle. We would log into B2L to them and then visit the little the page that says here's your Yeah, I put it in the gray book, just like I would any other kind of feedback. And it usually has a preamble that says, this week I talked with you feedback, copy and paste this URL into a new browser window, play and follow along. That's it. We have about 40 minutes left, and I have about two hours worth of content. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of keep moving through, but keep if you have questions, feel free to feel free to ask. Um, screen cast screen cast you kind of see it's some of the same same things. Uh, but when you're giving feedback to students, are you showing them how to do something and then giving them an assignment? Now you need to go through and do that. We can begin to move up that taxonomy to where they begin to apply that knowledge. And this comes from how are you going to um, assess them? What are you going to have them do having watched the video? Um, the next one, a, a three camera shoot and instructional how to. I do all of these with three cameras, um, and then I can do it in one take. I actually do three takes. The first one always gets thrown away. The second one 
is usually good enough to keep with, with a faculty member. And the third one is usually great because I tell them the second one is good enough and they relax. And then the third right. take is, is fluff. Um, and they, there's a little bit more personality to it. Kelly Canola, we did um, you know, maybe eight or ten videos of hers. Here's how you make a bowl. Here's how you throw a cylinder. Here's how you move the extruder. Um, and it was just a series of videos <coughs> that she doesn't have to reteach students on day one this and then they're gone and she has to take time and come back and sit down and do it again. She says, hey, tomorrow you're going to throw a bowl, here's a video, and then she, they come in and do it and she can just pull it out and help with it. Um, same thing, Fred Hanks from Stephen Loring. These are our tech instruction instructors. And what he can do, Fred can show me here, is you see close up, he's how to bind a book and you use a, a hook shaped needle. And we can get the camera right down in there so they can see that sharp point as he jams it with his finger and blood spurts out. <laughs> it's really exciting. <laughs> um, but being able to get the students close. I can sit up here and I can say, okay, here's how you here's how you thread it. But actually me standing in front of you is less valuable than you being able to be close. So here would be a great reason to use um, to use video. Um, Oh, if, if Apple did a new thing, how to shoot on an iPhone, there's three short training videos, and they're all about 30 seconds or a minute. If you want a good idea of how to do a really quick take an instructional video, um, these are the short ones that I think of it, and how to shoot on an iPhone 7. Just look at what for that. So instructional how to is complexity. We're starting to get a little bit more complicated just because I have three cameras. You don't need three cameras. The advantage of three cameras is I can deliver the content once and have the camera just catch have cameras catch everything. If I only have one camera, I can just stand in front of you, talk about it, do it, and then I need to do it again to put the camera in a different position and then edit those shots back together. So if I can do a wide shot of the room, a close-up on my speaker, and then a close-up or a medium shot technically on my speaker, and then a close-up on whatever they're doing with their fingers. Um, it actually goes pretty quick for these instructional how to. But again, we'll move it up towards that applying and teaching us through how to do something, and then they will they will actively do it. Peter Bahatchik in the desert. I, I taught with him for eight years at uh, <coughs> high school, and, and when he started this idea, he said, I hate having to come in and show my students how to do this lab all the time. And he, he created about um, when he came in, he said, I need a graphic overlay. So he, he gets measurements, very specific measurements and weights, and then, well, that's the guy. They're very short. Um, so this So you can guess as the as the bubble will watch it, as it slows down, Einstein drops. So he might say something like, "We're spinning at this rate. Um, Einstein weighs this much. We anticipate the friction is about here or at this level. What speed will he need to be going before he, he slides down and touches the ground?" Or he'll ask a series of questions after he creates a video like this. Um, so Peter created, uh, initially did it with just a couple, and then he said, yeah, if, I could, if I could get a camera that shoots a thousand frames per second, just think about it. So then he started looking for cameras, and he wrote really a camera, and he got this fantastic camera that I took home and had my kids get split gun fight with. It's super slow motion in the water. <laughs> Um, he uses it for important things and I use it for playing. But then he, he wrote a couple more grants. So he's produced 100 of these, maybe 150 of these, and they're they're delivered through um, MIT is delivering the, the some of them now or using them in, in their coursework, and so is Carlton Cirk. I don't know if I put that in here, but it's right on S E R C at Carlton. And you can buy hatchet, you find them. You can find all of his videos and the assignments and, and the assessments that he would associate with them. And so he came up with a great way to do the simulation and then have students. He said, I hate word problems, the train traveling, these things, and this thing. 
this leads me to see that happen. So this guy, um, a whole bunch of really fun ones, I encourage you to go, to go and look for them if you get a chance. But, um, here's a, a reenactment if you're doing psychology or if you're doing some training with people you can like through act out the scene. And then the assessment might be you can use a psychoanalyze like they just said and those kinds of things. And another example is um, this prison probation services. So case studies and simulations, um, documentary film analysis is another one. This is one of the Wes Anderson's one favorite. Uh, but this is a great one for shot choices, camera movements and panning. What psychologically what's happening to the view when the camera does this, that, or the other thing. So you can have students evaluate what it is they're seeing, do an analysis of that. But up here, students um, reviewed, the students had to create the documentary and then structure, construct the use of it. Same thing with Peter Bahatchik, you know, move those advanced students into uh, the creation phase. So he gives them some, but then he has students that do independent studies with him and make all of the videos for them. And that's both great for the instructor, but it's also fantastic for the students because they have to do all the calculations. There's um, some really students that are doing that with him. Um, documentary film analysis. Some of those same things that, that you, you're analyzing and applying depending on your assignment. Um, the student comprehension demos. I use this one a lot. This is one of my students. Um, we just are finishing a 110 video series on every dance move on the planet. Um, ballet, not ballet. Right. <laughs> and then that becomes a great resource for every intro to dance or intro to ballet. Students and instructor can say, I need to know how to go through that and this, that, and the other thing. And they can just go back to the second. Of dance moves and the instructors and to show them or they don't have to use the try to figure out which one of those moves is. These are 10 second dance videos that show this is that's the move. That wasn't not the move. Uh, <laughs> I just demonstrated beautifully students in their dance moves. Um, another one up here, and I'm going to jump off of the St. Olaf video to the next. <clears throat> Our art. The museum curator also is a staff member and teachers. And our museum probably has a lot of material that isn't displayed. They've got a beautiful collection someplace that nobody ever gets to see. <laughs> and so what she did is she took her students and she said, I want you to go through all of, all of our paintings, all of our sculptures, and find the four that mean something to you. And explain what the thread is that ties them all together around some kind of thing. You talk about it in kind of an artsy fartsy way. My name is Julia Olson. I'm a senior art history major and will be talking about the sublime. To me, the sublime is something that provokes awe and wonder. It's monumental, overwhelms the senses, and is. So this also gives our. The folks that work in our community or uh, live around us not able to see all of this art that isn't out on display. And so it, it served a couple purposes. Um, and I really think it's a, it's a great, great one. It places me in direct contact with the sublime. <clears throat> and here, well, I should have shown with Fabio. He does a great job. I gotta show Fabio. Um, Oh, yeah, I don't have Sure. Well, Fabio does a great job. He, um, all of our students go through, and as part of their training, they have to find one piece of equipment. It's often a new piece of equipment that they don't have any training for. And they need to demonstrate to a novice how to use that equipment. Um, and you can do that with a technique on any film you can get a software. But what happens is my students demonstrate that they can make a video, they know how to edit, but they're also creating value for me in that now when somebody says, hey, check out the video system, I'm not sure which one I need, then they can just watch it and say, oh, that one looks like it'll work, it'll work great, and I can do it how to do it. So there's a lot of value in that, that kind of thing, too. And when you get the students in the process of teaching, you're really giving up 
that means taxonomy. They are now creating it. They're going to remember it. They're going to have something that they can stick in their portfolio if they do it well. <coughs> There's great value in having the student teach or to, to create the video. And the video doesn't have to be brilliant. It could just be set up the camera and say, now you got to talk in the video. And their anxiety level goes up. They're a little bit nervous about being on the camera. What does it look like? Um, and that will actually help them attain what it is they're learning. And then what we can say. You can use that video if it's a good one. For some that we don't keep. Um, so, activity five. No, activity. What five goals will your video meet? You wrote down a learning goal and how you're going to assessment. Assess it. Not just somewhere off on the side of it. Consider checking off a couple of the boxes that you think your video might help you with. So, just to clarify, we're supposed to write down some of the Points that we yeah. incorporate. Yep, if you think the learning goal in your video will be a good demonstration video, um, or it will, it will provide good demonstration things, then we'll just write demonstration over the margin. And what do you think, what level of these taxonomy do you think that video would get your student to? <clears throat> And they want to just get an overview of how to use a pencil, or are they going to learn and apply that skill somehow? And I'm going to rock and roll. We'll keep moving here a little bit. One of the things that kills me is somebody walks in and says, Deanna, I just need to make a quick 10 minute video. <laughs> and to me, that 10 minute video, I said, one minute of video will take me three hours. That is, if, if I just need to sit down and do a quick screencast, I still want to script it, I still want to come up. Figure out how I'm going to film it, what I'm going to show. But it could be, it could take me a week to work on one minute of video if it, if it involves resources and, and scripting and final visuals. Um, planning and scripting something, one to three hours, recording one to three hours, editing one to ten hours. Unless you're just doing a one camera screen recording and you're editing and nothing, you're just done. Susan, how long do you suppose it takes you to stand in the, uh, the mechanic shop and record that? Oh, it took me a good half hour. <laughs> you make me sick. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, like, I made a half an hour of standing there and recording because I did it multiple times. Right. Um, and a lot longer than that to, you know, someone had asked me, did I write this down? I think for that one, I might have written an initial script months before to read through and literally time how long it was going to be because I knew I wanted it to be at about two to three minutes. So I did have some of that kind of in my head when I went in there. But it, it, there's a lot of prep work. Mm -hmm. If you do it well and you can reuse it, I think you can recoup some of that some of that time down the road too. We talked about this, uh, YouTube videos, there's not much buy-in from people after one minute, you only have about 59% sticking with it. But even with certificate-seeking students, by three to four minutes, and I wonder if this is NX or um, NX, um, NX, um, emerging trends, what do you find? For students seeking the certificate, when they have buy-in, they still, after three to four minutes, you only have 58% of them. You're losing viewers if you have a long video, or they're just jumping ahead and they're missing some of those things. The video is short. Duration, I think three minutes, no longer than six minutes. Here's an edX video of under six minutes is open to significantly greater learning engagement. Um, so you, you can't go to six minutes. And this is one of the most difficult things for me when I work with faculty. They have a, a great lesson, and every moment of it is brilliant. And you have to include it all. Mm -hmm. And so I say, okay, I want I want you to break it into ten chunks for me. You got a fifty minute lecture, I want point one, point two, point two, point three, and then I would like to have what are the students going to do after they watch point one? What what little activity so that they retain it. So it isn't to say you can't include a lot of information, but you need to break it up into bite-sized chunks for them. <clears throat> this is hard for us as well. Um, so I, I don't, a one camera shoot where the visual never changes, where it's just in, um, is, is different on the brains of um, youth. When, you know, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 
um, we would do one camera shoots and the camera would be set up and we would just be mesmerized by a moving picture. Nowadays, students are taking in information. They've been trained, we've been programmed to read a screen really quickly. And the average shot right now changes every two and a half seconds. If your visual is not changing, that's two and a half seconds is pretty fast. That's MTV, it's the kind of stuff. Things are bouncing all over this. But if you're, if you're not changing your shot, moving from slide to slide in 10 seconds or so, your students are bored to tears and then they're clicking on something else and they're multitasking while they're missing what you're saying and they're, they're doing something else while the video is doing. So keep that in mind. The average shot duration right now is two and a half seconds. How can you keep your visual moving? Um, Bill Gates said, five years from now on the web, we'll be able to find the best lectures in the world that will be better than any single university. Susan and I had a great discussion on this that we thought we should have with you, but we're not going to, Susan, because I think we're going to move to it. But okay. Give me just kind of your quick overview, Susan. Um, all right. Well, what, what struck me about that was, first of all, he said that in 2010, and now it's 2017. So, are the best videos available online? And, or the best lectures, I mean, and if you can watch them, how effective are they if they're just served up with no context or nothing to do afterwards? So I could probably watch the best lecture from MIT, but I don't know what I can do with that. Right, and I'd agree. I think we broke that sentence into two parts. Best lectures in the world are online. Yes. Is it better than any single university? No. It's what you do with those videos that, that makes the learning happen. Um, Tips for editing video uh, from TED, uh, and there's, they have a little blog that TED back on tips for editing video. First, get the camera close. In life, we are really interested in, like people, for example, walking down the street, you're walking down the street, and you're looking at somebody walking towards you, and you're kind of checking them out, but you're, you're looking at them, and then as soon as they get close and they make eye contact with you, you want to be really interested in, in people, in getting close. But we're afraid to do it. So we need lawyers or let your students be lawyers. Get them really close to whatever they're talking about. And it'll hold their interest. So get the camera closer. If you're doing some editing, cut on the action. So I, when I set up three cameras and somebody makes a gesture, look at this screen. When there is movement happening is where I will put that edit point. And it helps the edit seem less jarring. So I'm going from a static picture to another <laughs> static picture. The viewer is aware of the cut. If you have action when it's happening, the student or the viewer is aware of the action and they don't pay attention to, to where the cut is. They forget it's a big thing. So cutting on the action is important. Keep changing the visual in a relevant manner. Come up with another image. Um, if you have text on screen, then the big text that's important, reinforcing something that you said, or you have a, a visual up there, and then change it and then change it. Instead of having one slide up here with all of these six pictures on it, and I just stand, and it's interesting, I buy that slide. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> if I, instead do one at a time, and I'm moving through it, your eyeballs are searching through that, and you're, you're engaged more, because I'm giving you the information quicker. It's that 2.5 seconds. So uh, keep changing that visual. Edit your mistakes. It's, it's okay. Once you learn your software, if it's screencasting software, if you're using a lecture capture system that just lets you do really basic trimming, cut out the beginning where you're organizing your papers. You've got, you're losing students and you're losing your viewers. Cut out the part in the middle where you say, uh, should put one, but I'm not sure. Oh, that's right. Get in there, find it, and do a quick little cut so that you're condensing time to get that video shorter and take out the things that it's going to make your viewer lose it. Um, step away from your edit. Yeah, that's kind of funny. Like that. <laughs> and then the function. Well, we do this with our videos. We do three to five hundred videos a year um, with my 30, 30 students. And I have some really talented students, and I'm okay. And all of us are sitting in there working and doing editing. But a big part of our process is to stop and we bring in what we call a post production supervisor. There's some of the students who are good at it. And I don't care if I have the best student working on a project. Another set of eyes looks at the video because you'll just miss things. I've been staring at this thing for a while. So, so step away from your edit, walk away, go get a coffee, come back and look at it. We'll get another set of eyes to look at it and give you some critical feedback. That's really important, otherwise you lose. It's interesting. Uh, 
I didn't have anybody look at my presentation that I had a couple of mistakes on it, so I should have done Script and outline. This is on the sheet that's in front of you, so you don't need to write everything anything down. But when I meet with faculty to talk about an instructional video, they have to come with a learning goal. They have to come with how they want to assess it. And then I encourage them to bring in a script that looks something like this. Um, a topic, topic and intro, or two to four sentences, or two to four sentences, 15 to one sentence. What are the learning outcomes? Give me kind of an overview, because we'll repeat that later on, and I'll help it stick and see explain. One to three steps, two to four minutes, one step is great. Keep that video short, sometimes it's a process. I mean, we do these three things. So I, I say one to three steps, and then some kind of review or summary. And don't include, now, if you're not watching this video, you're going to go and play. You don't say that, because you're going to learn, have the students watch the video, and they get it. And it sucked, and now I need to tweak the assignment, and you don't want to recreate the video. So you just give them the content and keep the assessment very simple. Um, we won't necessarily go through this again. You have the handout, but we're looking at that activity, the next activity slide too. Um, yeah. I encourage you, with whatever that learning goal is, to sit down and script it out. Kind of keep this structure as a way to develop, a way to develop that. Um, Remember, avoid specific assignments for each point. All right, the value of the visual. Uh, this is actually a combination of like five or six different studies. So there's there's a range on it. Um, you know, one of the studies says students or viewers are going to remember seven percent of what is said and ninety three percent of what they see. And another study said students are going to remember forty percent of what they um, what they heard and 60% of what they see. Either way, what I want you to get out of this is they're going to remember more about what they see than what they hear. You've got to have the visual and reinforce your concept. And that can't just be text on a screen, but if you have a visual um, of it, also, also very good. Um, so plan your visuals. You have on the back side of that instructional video, starter doc is, is a storyboard form. And I use something very similar to that with backgrounds and that is what I do with faculty. So I say, okay, now we have the script. I want you to either write in what the visual will be. If you're working with somebody who works in the museum, they're also an artist, so they're going to draw a beautiful story where they could go into a career storyboard. But you need to think through before you create that video, what is the visual that will match what I'm saying right now? And so if you um, um, if I can add something there, that's where I often think of whatever the metaphor might be or if there's an object. I can remember one video I needed to make that the topic was student engagement. And I used a new iPod that I had just gotten in, a new little technology gadget because that was engaging me. And even though I no longer use that little iPod and I don't even think they make them, the video still has relevancy because I equated it with a little technology tool. So that was my visual. And what I will do with something like a PowerPoint, I've got this is a PowerPoint and this is a post. Nobody wants to sit and watch an hour and 20 minutes, though I am riveting either. <laughs> um, what I'll do is go and break this down into five minute chunks. And I'll, I'll deliver each and I'll, I'll create a, a video of each one of these important. And so that there is a visual and then it condensed it. And then if I ever do this again, or if we create a website that says, here's how to do these things, people can watch it in those chunks. So using what you're already doing with lectures and those kinds of things, I'm just cutting them into the little points. These are some examples of close ups that, that we're using. Just get the camera close. It could be something that you're doing on the screen, uh, but it could also be a, a demonstration, physical demonstration. Rule of thirds. Your eyes belong in the top one-third of the, of the screen. We've been trained to know that this person is on equal, equal par with me. Um, I'm on the, the same level as you. If the camera's position, oh, here's how it's going. This is about where, where you're going to frame that head. is either at the top of the frame or darn close to the top of the frame and the eyes are at the one-third line. Um, when you watch a film, they move that camera position 
This is the main one of my favorite films of all time. Uh, at the beginning, Prince Humperdinck, he's the king, he's up above us, so the camera is positioned low. They could put that camera anywhere for the shot, but they want us, the viewer, to think that he is up, up above us, so they bring that camera down a little bit lower. Same thing, Wesley's now stuck to a rock, but these guys, um, he's climbing up the bits of the sand, um, and these guys are looking down, so they are in a position of power. The camera is lower than they are, and they're looking down. Wesley's now been captured. Camera's up above him, and he's in a vulnerable position. Um, Princess Buttercup here has got her hands tied. She's sitting there, um, and she is in a vulnerable position as well. When you are filming, that camera needs to be at or slightly below. It makes you seem just a tiny bit smarter. Slightly below eye level um, for your view. Just like Susan has done brilliantly in the Skype setting. Um, and then, get me close, the, that visual is terribly important. So, uh, Iocane powder, it's ordered to stasis, dissolves instantly in liquid, and it's going to kill one of the two people in the next scene. So, we need to get close. Alfred Hitchcock says the size of an object in the brain is directly proportional to its importance. If a gun is going to shoot somebody, Hitchcock has that gun take up the entire frame because that would be important. This isn't just any range. Get me close to the ring so I can see what sets it apart. So use close ups, and it doesn't matter what you're talking about. Get me close. Um, producing, reinforce your key points. I often add text. He was talking about English literature, um, and he didn't want to have books in front of him, which is great. So we just put, dragged him off one side so that we could put text up on screen with him. This was just a neat discussion, and there was almost nothing on the screen. but her key points, also in this because she wanted to be close to the nurse, so he saw an example of her pointing at the text, we are really close to the text. Or, here we are working in the shop, these are the hazards, and we put the visual up there. People will remember the visual more than they will remember what he was saying. Avoid distracting backgrounds. Uh, draw or sketch some visuals, great. We'll talk a little bit about lighting, but not much. Shadows make things look scary. Um, so if you want to appear friendly and approachable, you light from one side, and that creates shadows on the other side. So then you need to light from the other side. And then if you really want to, you hit yourself in the back of the head with a little light, and it kind of gets some depth, and it makes it look pretty good. Um, but if you want to make the baby look scary, shadows. Um, beautiful actress, scary liberty. <laughs> and they didn't need to light this way, but they did to accentuate the feeling they want to be about. So make sure that you are lighting well. Susan, what do you got? I got a light ring. <laughs> and I also sit in front of a window as much as possible. But, yeah. I could be doing this from my office, but my office has no windows, and it's more difficult to control. So I'm here for light. So, window is a great option. This is 150 bucks. Best color, B E S C O R. It's not cheap, but it lets you control the color a little bit too. What's up? I just want to get you if you only had budget for one light, what light would you get? I would get three. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I've done that. We have, we, when I was doing a teaching at the high school level, the students would come in and we had no budget, it's called the high school, but we had to do it. So I went out to Home Depot and I bought a bunch of these and just clamp them up in different places. I would get different intensity modes um, for that kind of thing. We have to have a little bit of a If you are, if you're mobile, you need to travel a light. What light would you bring? Well, the, if, if we were to break it up into key light, which is going to be the most important one, you can have a white sheet of paper, a poster board that can sit opposite that and can help bounce some of the light back in, or natural sunlight or a window. But I would get, um, everything's LED now because you can control the color temperature on, on most of them. Um, ARRI, A-R-R-I, has a good um, three light kit. But uh, well, that's gonna be 600 bucks or 800 bucks. Um, if you're doing screencasting type things, all you need is one light that kind of hits you from both sides. And Susan says the window works well, um, but she's sitting right in front of one of these right now, and because of its shape, it gives you a little bit of light from both sides. And that's a great option for screencasting. 
And I'm not head on right now. I could reorient myself. Well, yeah. anyway, that's better. Yeah. No, no. Um, I would avoid the company of Cowboy Studio. I've ordered some from there and they're cheap and they fall apart. The best store is one step away. I just have yeah, another quick follow up. So if you, if you're in a situation where you know that you have enough available, like, to serve the purpose of a key light, um, would you bother bringing another light? And if so, would you bring a fill or would you bring a light? Okay. You've got a budget, get a reflector. Um, is there a, a, one of those holes up around circling things that can, can box it back? Um, your, your fill light is essentially the same light, it's usually a little less intense. Um, and you can make light less intense just by moving it further away from the subject as well. Um, but that same kind of light could just be positioned behind. I would do the fill and then just hope the ambient light or something that covers the curtain of that. Um, sound, uh, I'll do this really quickly. These are the mics that I like and I use uh, on your technical station point one. For voiceover, I work as an acting director and do voiceovers as well. I have one of these at home. And I have one of them at, at, at school. And so I use this when I need to do the voiceovers. This is a great mic, just 40 bucks. It's like 130 bucks now for this mic. It's like this the desktop mic. But they're great. You can just hand it back on the and say, yeah, we're, we're really recording. Um, your phones do an amazing job. Audio still isn't quite as good as the video. The video quality is great. Our phones, audio is only okay. Um, the webcams, you both have great lenses. And great microphones. It's what we're using here. And so you can able to hear all of you wherever you're at and see all of you that day. Uh, so I would recommend that as a microphone. And then if you get a little MP4 camera, and you use the onboard microphones, generally hard to hear. Uh, so spending, you know, this is maybe 140 bucks for a little mic like this <coughs> is valuable. It really helps, helps your audio. But audio is not important as what? Oh, all right. Good internet. When you're editing, keep your volume between negative six and negative negative twenty-four decibels. Negative six, negative twenty-four decibels. Make sure when you're recording that you don't have a jackhammer going outside. Even hearing something like the air conditioner or the projector in a room can impact the in the background. So just be aware. Sometimes we have to stop. Can we do that when we're filming on a location? You just stop when you're for a room phone. A lot of noise going on in this room. I would turn things off so that I don't have that hum in the background. Um, you can get rid of it, but we'll talk about that later. A lot of different camera options. I would just say go over 1920 by 1080. Um, at the minimum, we're moving up to 4K, but 1920 by 480. And then there's a bazillion different things, but there's a lot of value in getting a camera that records straight to MP4. Because you can do your quick recording and then shove it off to YouTube or Vimeo or whatever you do. When you can answer the system. Is that is there something you're adding there to me? No. No, no. Sounded like a big sigh or a... <laughs> no. Uh, Sorry. A lot of different editing options as well. Uh, the Adobe Premiere, Final Cut Pro, those are the two that I'm most familiar with you like. Um, I think is fantastic uh, and easy. Lots of people have a Windows movie maker, I don't know if films down on it. Um, it's the most basic thing, it's it's my um, iMovie for iPhone is a great little app that lets you do a nice recording and do quick edits. Uh, and so you don't have to have high end stuff. You can do some great stuff just standing in front of a window with, with your iPhone. What's that? Me. Did you say you? Yes. <laughs> they, um, we give them a little MP4 camera. Um, it's a it's a Canon ZR something or other, and all, and we we have one of my students made a great training video how to use it. Here's how you turn it on, play the SD card. So we say here's how you do it. Here's the video for it, and then that's that's most of it. Um, if we if we need to, then I sit down and there's something where it's just ending the screen. There's something similar to that, and I would if I'm going to edit it for him, I'm going to shoot it. Really well. There's a lot of factors of just doing quick recordings and pushing them out. That's a good question. 
Oh, uh, in a nutshell, I'm like, I'm like, plan well, feel well, light well, keep the edit simple. What do you got? Yeah, no, I think um, the thing that I would say to many people is you have to get over the fear of talking to the camera. Your nose, your voice, all the, I hear those as complaints from my students. I don't want to make a video because I'm very self-conscious. Get over it and think of this as an opportunity to really connect with your audience. So get your message together, like Dan says, get your learning objective together. Think about that message and deliver it in the most personal, intimate way that you can. Uh, there are good points, of, as we've brought in, I don't talk about assignments when I'm talking about content because I, I want my videos to last and not to have to do this every three months when I teach the course again. Um, and as I shared with you, I record, I don't over edit um, to the point of what faculty are most comfortable. This is my favorite little tool. It's, it goes right to MP4, and then I use Camtasia to trim the beginning and the end, and then that's it. Well, what is that device? Well, this is a flip camera. They're no longer manufactured, <laughs> but you can still buy them. Um, my daughter, who sometimes sets up and who owns my light ring, uses a Nikon, and it's a cool fix. It's a, you know, one that does still as well as video. She also has a video camera that she can pull out. But I haven't learned to use it yet. So in the next one minute, we're going to talk to the assessment for videos. And so that will happen very fast. Uh, using something that gives you analytics has value. Uh, we have lecture capture systems that are in the systems that offer it. But I can quickly tell which how many of my students started watching this video, 24 of them. Um, in the first 10 seconds, um, most didn't, except for the ones that I said least from somewhere else in the video. So then it looks like I have one um, I can also see individual students, how, how much they're watching or not watching. Um, student number two over here, watch none, watch none, okay, she clicked right there, so I can see she clicked. Right um, this is UJA, which would be like a Y-U-J-A. It's a lecture capture system. Um, we looked at Tegrity and Panopto. UJA is, is a new, it's a very young company that's still developing, and we feel that often. But they're still developing. So if you're shopping for it, they're doing some great things. Uh, yeah. Um, at this point, it looks even better. I don't think it offers quite what Tangerine does, but it's not too shabby. I can also do this video quiz, and this is what I love about using this, and why I was so hard. Uh, we're not going to watch the whole thing. Kind of like you might have to drag me out of the whole thing. So you can have a video and then you can have a quiz happen after the video. But what this this does is I Tell me of the world two hundred years ago in able the size of the population. But the colonized countries in Asia and Africa all stacked down. So it'll it'll populate the quiz. I can have it tied right into my Google or, or wherever, and then students can click on it and they can take the quiz. They're not gonna re remember this. What this does from your video. I put the video in, and then I set a marker, and I said, these are the questions. And right now, Yuja only offers multiple choice. They're developing one this summer. Yeah, they don't And I think there's great value to it, except uh, the primary value is that they're going to they'll come back to your video. They'll start watching it. They're going to do seven round of things, and then, oh, I should hit stop. I better answer that question. And then um, I think there's a lot of value kind of built in there. Not really as are they learning. So maybe you'd ask a predictive question that you can start off and then you do it. I don't think they're really learning, but I think it's a great way to keep them both in each other. Um, hey, Dan. Yeah. I'm aware that we're running out of time, and there are two more points that I think we need to make. Okay. One has to do with closed captioning. Mm -hmm. So your videos should be closed captioned. I use a service, I pay for someone to caption since I don't have a script that I can just input, and it's worth my time to do that. Um, Dan and I have both discussed the value of having a captioner. The, do you want to say anything about that, Dan? I agree with you. Okay, good. 
the other thing is you do need to think about where you're serving your video from. Uh, at one point, the university decided to put my videos on YouTube, and I screamed because after they were finished playing, makeup tutorials were served up, things that were completely irrelevant. So I, again, pay for a Vimeo because that service allows me more control over the look and the feel. And I, when it comes to that, I am a control freak. I don't want just anybody seeing my instructional videos, and I don't want them watching funny cat videos. <laughs> so those are two points to consider. Thank you very much. Hey, you got it. Thank you.